Last summer we with Threads, we were talking about what's next for social. And I think, Dave, you were like predicting a, a renaissance of sorts. And I, I think this conversation kind of validates that. Yeah, my, my answer to you on this, Jess, is I might just have to build something new. I know, but you say that. You well, either tempt get, me with an app tuned. or an op ed. An app or an op ed. Op eds are easier. Hi, friends. What's cooking? Hey, guys. We're here. Back at it. And you're there. Back at it. (laughs) I think our children have the latest spring break on the planet. I think it should be called... you're definitely last. Summer break. (laughs) Basically, it's... That's longer. (laughs) Yeah. I tell people I'm on spring break and they think I'm just blowing them off. And I'm like, no, Mm. really. Well, given the amount of kids actually time spent in school, we should just call it summer, like spring school. And the assumption is... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's a different topic, but but a good one. So we're going to need the Morins to really tell us what's happening in the world this week. But a welcome to everybody, and thanks for tuning in to uh, More or Less. And just kidding, we actually know what's happening in the world, and a lot's happening. Like, even outside of tech, a lot is happening. All right. Morins, what's cooking? Where do we start? Dave, over to you. Well... In our back channel this week, there was a really interesting chart shared by our friend Oren Hoffman about California losing tech jobs. And I'll see if I can actually pull it up here and show everyone what we're talking about, um, if I can get this to work. But effectively, the chart shows that California tech sector job growth has actually stagnated and is looks like it stagnated in about the middle of 2022 and has been, uh, or I'm sorry, I guess it depends on which version of this chart you're looking at, and has been declining steadily. Yeah, Mm -hmm. exactly. Um, Here, I'll get it up on the screen so that we can take a look at it here. It says, tech jobs are leaving California. And this has been a, you know, conversation that's been going on quite a bit since the pandemic started. And, you know, we've talked about not just this, but also like, are people going to stay in a remote work world or a hybrid work world? What does that have to do with this? And then there's this other question, which a lot of people are talking about in the Bay Area, which are, you know, there's sort of a narrative that things are back. Like we're, you know, Jess, you were talking about that last week or the week before. We're we're seeing a lot more activity in the Bay, especially because of AI. And so the debate in the back channel was like, is this chart real? And Sam, I Mm -hmm. thought you had actually a really interesting point, uh, which I thought I'd tee you up for. Well, a few things. First of all, let's start with like how to, the classic book, How to Lie with Statistics. This looks much <laughs> more dramatic than it is, right? This is like the, the, the axis being charted here is percent of total <laughs> tech jobs, not actual tech jobs, right? And, and so, it, the variance is 15 to 19 percent. Yeah, exactly. So this is classic. This is my, one of the most important books. I like. credit to my early education, but I remember in like third or fourth grade, they had us read this book, How to Lie with Statistics, which was fabulous. And uh, basically taught you about all sorts of things like cutting off the axes and charts and things like that to make a point, even if it's not true. So let's not over rotate on what this chart even shows. But that said, I think the more interesting question for me is like, one, how do you define a tech job and how that's changing, obviously? And then most importantly, I don't really care how many tech jobs are in California. I think what's much more interesting to talk about is effectively how much revenue or profit per worker you're getting from various tech jobs because as ai and just tech leverage in general increases like it's kind of irrelevant who quote unquote works in tech the question is in some ways like the productivity of your tech workers and my bet what i was saying in the back channel is my bet is that the productivity of california tech workers is off the charts compared to the rest of the country yeah. that's the assertion yeah. and i'm doing that with no data just intuitive feel that if you look at like where all the big companies are and where all the tech profits are, it's good. I mean, if anything, the, the big tech companies have shed useless workers, right? And are now more profitable per worker, tech worker, which is good. That's called like capitalism and productivity. So I'm less concerned if as a percentage of total tech workers, however you define that, there's fewer in California. 
I thought they all moved to Austin. That would have been my assumption. But mm-hmm. then Austin home prices and apartment rents have fallen more than anywhere else in the country. In the last How's Miami months? holding up? Well, Ooh, I, I guess I'll bring question. it back up so we can take a look. Okay. They actually had a another statistical chart that we can take a look at that shows this Ch- change in non-farm payroll since Jan 2020. And you guys are right. It, it is showing quite a bit of increase in what looks like, you know, Texas, Florida, Georgia. Yeah, so basically what I see here is California, specifically San Francisco, is the big old red dot saying we can be more productive with fewer tech workers and more profitable, good. And then basically offshoring a bunch of quote unquote tech jobs to lower expense, less expensive markets. This is just like literally globalization just playing out on a US basis. There's nothing to be concerned about. It's just kind of funny. Right, is the way I would look at it, right? Sam, I guess, uh, like, the people pushing the narrative of the exodus of Bay Area talent, which I also think is overblown, like, what's your counter to that? Is it just that actually we're keeping the talent that's going to continue to make this an attractive place for new company formation? Or, like, why does it matter just to play? Oh, because people don't want to pay taxes. It's really simple. Like, basically, the, the narrative, which I get, I don't like paying California taxes either, is very simple, which is you have a bunch of people who, like, hate how expensive California is from a tax perspective. So they're trying to scare California and to stop being so expensive, right? From a labor perspective, housing, but then also just, like, straight-up taxes and uh, saying, hey, like, you have to move or you're going to lose your tech center. What I actually think the reality is, sure, you might have fewer tech workers, but if all the most expensive, productive, good tech workers are in California. Like, I mean, I wish it were true because I'd love to push tax rate down, but like that's the, the yeah, framework. Yeah, but California is like, haha, we have the longest, most beautiful coastline in the entire country and we will no, charge whatever taxes we want. Which off the coastline. <laughs> we were Doesn't just matter. with some people yeah. who did like a big climate analysis and we're screwed. Also a good topic, but let me f- rephrase the question. Just so what? What if there was an exodus of talent from the Bay Area? Of all well, then, then you'd have a death spiral of they can't, there's no tax base. And if the tax base goes down, you can't have nice things. And then the cities all fall apart. Which again, I want to be clear, like, I think there's some truth to some of that. But I, don't, I wouldn't argue that any of this is that truth. And I guess my point is also that's bad for California. I don't think it's necessarily, is it bad for the technology industry? Is it bad for the world? Is it bad? No, no. I mean, I I actually wrote an information editorial many years ago Mm, saying this was pre-pandemic, saying that actually one of the best things that could happen for U.S. politics would be for California to send all of its workers out to other municipalities. Right now, you sucked all of like the rich liberal people in the one zone with just two senators. And like, actually, if you wanted to change politics, what you should do is take all those people and pay them to go live in lots of small towns all over America and vote and take over those towns. This was before the pandemic. Ironically, that happened during the pandemic, right? But like, not intentionally. But like, if if Google and Facebook and everyone said, hey, we're going to take our tech force and intentionally distribute it to take over politics, that would be quite wise. Yeah, but I think you can you can make an even more optimistic, more case here, which is, it's a really good thing that we're exporting tech jobs all over the country. And Sam, I think to put even finer point on it, if you look at the defense economy, you know, the defense economy has companies in every single state in the union, right? They have people with defense jobs in every city, every major city in every state, every senator has somebody that the defense economy... Pork. They used to trade for that shit. Yeah. And so I think that it's a really good thing that these jobs are being exported to cities all over the country. In fact, I mean, looking at this chart, I wish it were... I'm sure this chart's like not necessarily showing the full diaspora, but I would love to see this happening in every single state in the country. Like that that to me would be a positive outcome, right? Like sharing, sharing the wealth of these jobs with the whole country is a good thing. I'll be more cynical. I think that would be nice. I think what's actually practically happening, though, is one, what is it a tech job these days? Like everything is a tech right. job. It's getting it's a definitional problem, right? Two, you take all your shitty tech jobs, tech jobs that aren't that important and ship them to lower cost centers in the US and abroad, right? And then three, what you see, if you believe my part of the narrative that I've been harping on for 18 months, which is if you really believe in the AI leverage story, like it's highly centralized in terms of like which companies are going to benefit from it. And I think within those companies, which teams drive the value from it is a small subset of those teams, right? And I don't see those jobs getting highly distributed. I see them getting highly concentrated in 
California, maybe a little bit in New York as a token for the people who really want to stay on the East Coast. So I think it's like, I think you can read this stuff any way you want and argue about it any way you want. I would argue like, I don't see a huge shift happening here. And I think if you believe in centralization uh, with AI, which I do, you're just going to see more of that. Isn't it amazing? In well, I was just in New York, several people came up to me and asked like, or in, in the course of conversation, why the tech industry hasn't done more in New York. I mean, this was the perpetual, I mean, Sam, you started Is a that true? company in New York. It, there's still a perception that it, uh, it's a good question. I think what it means is like, why haven't we seen X billion dollar exits out of New York? I mean, that's usually the method. Because New York is too fun. Like, it's because it's too diverse and too fun. If you are... Like, people have built plenty of... I don't know about companies. that. You could argue it's too homogenous, right? Like, you've got two... Well, one, maybe two major industries that dominate every job in the city, right? And so... Mm-hmm. Yeah. And fashion. Fashion, fashion, finance. Fashion and Wall Media. Street. Yeah. Media. Like, everything's Tech. in New York. Yeah. yeah. I agree with Sam. It's too busy. No, I mean, I, I guess either, right? But just, it's the same Brit when everyone's like, we need more female founders who have achieved like this milestone, right? And then that milestone would like put that category on the map, whether it's, you know, European startups or New York startups or... I mean, there have been good New York startups, but I do think like the problem is, is like, look, there's just, there are too many places for talent to go. There's too much fun to be had, Right. Like if you want to live in New York and have a billion, a single one single billion dollars, like you have a lot of fun, right? Whereas like in California, you're like, it's boring, right? So you have to, you know, and so people and like people are weird. So what? they just are way more ambitious and empire building. Okay. I disagree okay, with you Okay. But there. what about the coastline? Isn't the coast- the coast, well, <laughs> you know, same old, same old. The coastline's falling off. You just can't live too near the coast. You get kind of rich in California and you like surf and ski, you know, and it's great. Just don't build your house in Big Sur. <laughs> what, what, Britt, why are you particularly upset about, you know, New York just had an earthquake. What's the deal with your, your, the coastline thing right now? Is there something going on I missed? Yeah, literally the road to Big Sur is closed <laughs> for like two months right now. It's the only way to get into Big Sur because it fell into the ocean. Like years ago also. I, I feel like that happened. Happens every year, but this time... This time it's pretty bad because it's so far north that it's cut all of Big Sur off. You know, it's kind of unclear when the... Wasn't there a well-known venture capitalist who had like a helicopter service running there for a while? Oh, yeah. Road yeah. yeah. We he's won't still call running him. that service. We, we won't call him out, but he's still doing it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, guys, I'm moving us along. First There's of only all... one that has a permit, Jess. <laughs> oh, you need permit. Wasn't he like shuttling school kids? Yeah, ridiculous. Yep. We'll yeah, listeners, guess who this who this person could be. Yeah, guess in the I'll comments. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Guess in the <laughs> comments. Right. Okay, okay. TikTok notes. No, before we go to oh, M and yeah. I want to mention that TikTok has started rolling out its Instagram rival, TikTok Notes, to select Android and iOS users in Australia and Canada. What's interesting is they call it an Instagram rival, but I sort of think it looks like more like a Pinterest rival. It's like a Two column feed with photo, short caption, and then you know when you click the photo, it expands and you have the ability to do the slide. Then it looks like more like Instagram. You know they're marketing it as share daily life, express cool ideas, every picture tells a story. So it's interesting because Instagram and Meta are notorious for copying other social platforms, and now TikTok is copying Instagram. So I would love to hear. Specifically, well, but it doesn't. What's a use case here? Because TikTok is mostly video based, right? And then the feed is single video feed as you're scrolling. They are making, I think, they're putting a lot more content above the fold on a single screen, but it's photo and still image based. So similar to Instagram, where you have reels, but you also have, you know, a still photo feed. It, it, I think, is trying to compete in that way. But it, again, it looks more like Pinterest. It sounds like some PM gone amok. Yeah. Right? This sounds like <laughs> someone, there was some strategy product. Speaking of which, I think it's a TikTok. Sam, were you showing me this of like the strategy guy or did I just get fed this in my own algorithms? There, uh, oh, you, I, I don't know. It sounds like something I would love. <laughs> but like, this is when tech companies have too many engineers and cash and and like slightly declining, you know, growth rates. 
I don't know if Why? people would you this. say like threads was a bad idea. Um, I don't think it was necessary. I guess I would say like totally I, unclear. I, I don't think the I, I think the product is quite good, but I I think if you look at the arc of Meta, I don't think Threads is going to be a huge part of the story. No. I'm not sure. I I yeah, I'm still holding it. Like I think there's an interesting one, but it said was Threads a good idea? Threads was like a totally fine tiny experiment that just happened to work. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think that like any, but like before it worked, when people said like, that is a very good idea or like, ah, you know, some PMs, like go, go play for a year and see what you come up with. Like, I think that's kind of more the vibe of it. But like once this thing, if you get it to work, you might as well follow through on it. Sure. Right? Don't you think like TikTok users, like TikTok's thinking, okay, our users use TikTok for reels and videos of this nature. It's more like entertainment, but they want a place to like share their photos and stuff with their friends. And right now they're leaving TikTok to go to Instagram to do that. And so I don't think it's a bad idea to launch TikTok. No, I'm not a fan of TikTok, but... I'm taking the Sam deeply cynical take on this one, which is that I think that for whatever reason, ByteDance woke up to watching, maybe watching Meta execute quite well on using all of their distribution channels to distribute threads, right? Like they're more aggressively mm-hmm. distributing threads than any asset they've ever distributed in maybe over five years, maybe 10 years. I mean, they're using the feed on Instagram. They're using notifications on Instagram. They're using every trick in the book to build threads. And they're, they've shown a pattern for how to do this with another asset. And they've got an attack on the you know, direct frontal assault by the U.S. government staring down their core assets throat. And so they need to diversify and create another asset, another surface as fast as possible. And so they've got the pattern of how to do it. And they're building, you know, they're they're putting it out there. And to me, like, that's what's going on. But theoretically, if TikTok, let's say, passes through the Senate, et cetera, and has to get shut down or bought TikTok notes would follow suit, right? It's not like that would be protected. But if they can just boost any active yeah, engagement in the yeah. meantime, it's like a... Why, 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 notes sounds ridiculous. Notes doesn't sound like an Instagram competitor. Notes sounds like a Twitter competitor. No, it's a photo-based. It's photo-based. Yeah, I haven't looked at the design I mean, of it. Pinterest has really struggled. Because- I like the idea of it being like, you know who we have to attack is Pinterest because that's the definitely the best business in social media. <laughs> <laughs> Let's attack the one that's the least good at monetizing. It's like you look at like a herd of animals, like we're going to pick off the weakest thing we can find. It's <laughs> like a little tiny straggler. Hey, I love Pinterest and I have a very large following on Pinterest. So I... I don't like you hating on my favorite social platform. Brit's like secretly got like one of the largest followings on Pinterest. I know, in the but world. how many times a week do you use it? Do you actively I, post? multiple times a week? I mean, right now I'm planning my son's birthday party. It's been like Pinterest City for it just depends on the thing I'm planning. Next week I have a haircut. I'm looking at hairstyles. I'm looking at you know See, Pinterest and you see those brunch that ideas. The most vulnerable to like AI. You're just being like so organized to use Pinterest. So big <laughs> round of applause for Brit for being yeah, organized. Yeah, we all know that enough. about Brit. Remind me your haircut there. You like go on Pinterest, do like haircuts. Yeah, and you no. Like a bunch of hair yeah. you like. Yeah. Okay. Man. Says the man with so much facial hair on his face right now from the <laughs> spring break of no shaving. <laughs> so you go on Pinterest and you say summer balayage ideas. 2024 <laughs> because you don't want to do an out balayage <laughs> balayage means oh, they like, it's like a new kind of highlighting that where they don't start at the root they do like down here yeah, in yeah. The like of think the hair. ombre middle of the hair it's ombre. not a new kind it's been around forever okay but I know sam, what ombre is. sam doesn't know what balayage it's is. it's a style so, of ombre sam i'm so glad dave knows this <laughs> anyway so i would I literally would go on and i'd be like Summer Balayage 2024. And I would see, like, what are the types? Is it more caramel? Is it more chocolate, cinnamon? <laughs> what are the colors that are trending right now? Oh and my Pinterest gosh. And then you me go the to best. your stylist and you yeah. say balayage me I like show this. Show her the yep. photo. I That's do. exactly what you do. Sam, you could do that next time you're at your mm-hmm. stylist. I have, a fo- I have a photo in Google Photos, which is called haircuts. And I show the haircut and I say this. So yeah. you're doing this. You're doing a version of this. Yeah, you're just not using Pinterest. It's just me with short hair. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe for my next haircut, I'm going to use TikTok notes to show I my also, stylist. My question too is like, okay, 
So I think Dave's right. And Threads is proving that you can leverage your distribution to get distribution. And Threads is also proving that with an app that wasn't acquired, which is kind of interesting and is not using the case. Facebook Facebook took like a 10-year hiatus from doing the thing that... I did have a point to make. I'm just going (laughs) to quickly make it, which is... But to make money off these things is a whole different question. And right now, it's like... Short form video is hard to make money off of. Just the PM that launched Nose did not do it to make money. They just want to get promoted. Okay. <laughs> I don't know, man. Fine. I think you can't launch a full new app surface by just being a PM. <laughs> Spoken like a bunch of I, PMs. My, yes. But I think it's a little bit more strategic than a, a rogue PM launching an entire new app. They're like, have you heard of this thing called Pinterest? But I just like imagine I, it, balayage. This looks exact. This looks like Instagram competitor, photo competitor to me. I, know. I hadn't looked at it until just now. I said it. The feed looks like Pinterest, but when you click in, it looks exactly like Instagram. So. Yeah, this is an Instagram competitor, pure Why and simple, we, which is what yeah. they've said. So now we're just back to what yeah. the announcement was about. Yeah. But so. Can I, can I pivot the conversation to a Threads experience thing with you guys? Yes. So here's an interesting thing I, I've noticed in my own experience. So I'm a cross poster. There's mm. stuff that I put on Twitter. Then Are people it still using it? Twitter? Yes. Threads. Threads. Well, here's the thing that I've found. I'm kind of curious how you guys are going. The, my u- universe used to be you post on Twitter and you post on the same thing on Facebook to your friends. Plus you post a bunch of other stuff on Facebook. In the last six months, I've had this experience of two things. One is thread starts. I'm like, eh, I have a bigger, the, the peop- I should post on threads. And then also LinkedIn has come from being a dog shit app to something that people actually care about all of a sudden. So like I post shit on LinkedIn, but now I'm like cross posting to three apps. And you know, what's actually lost out is the Facebook blue app. Mm-hmm. Which I just don't post to. That I just think you are actually behind on this. Yeah, Sam, welcome to 2024. No one's been posting on that app for like five yeah. years. Sam, you were my last friend posting on there. Like the blue app lost me like two or three years ago. Well, the interesting thing to me though is like you know, the Instagram. Like it's just interesting to me because I, I do wonder, at least for me, like my emotional experience is that Threads has actually cannibalized the blue app for me more than mm. anything else because I can only post. I mean, I can't post the same thing eighteen places. Even I won't do that. Mm. But it yep. is interesting. Like I don't. I, I. I mean, I've no obviously inside information on this, but like. I'm kind of curious what the patterns are around that, right? Clarify your question, though, around whether or not the the there's a transient move between Blue App and Threads or what? Yeah, like is Threads cannibalizing... For me, it feels like it's cannibalizing the Blue App in my own personal use. And I'm just wondering if other people... Isn't it more of a demographic user base now? Like the older generation still uses the Blue App? I, I would believe that. I would believe that old people have... And inf- don't use Threads. Threads was like made for millennials and Gen Z. I do think that there's a devil in the defaults thing here, which is that the blue app was like text first, then photo kind of situation, right? So like mostly if you were like thinking text, you were usually putting it in the blue app or you were putting it in Twitter and that you weren't putting text things into Instagram. That like wasn't really what you did with it, right? No. And so I, I do think that that transient property does exist, right? That like Threads, if you're just kind of using that loose way of thinking about it, then there's definitely you would imagine well, that would happen. It's funny. I mean, like I just feel like there's an interesting thing. Is I used to get like I think about it, like there's a lot. Of, I put a super I put a, a super set on Blue App, and then like a subset of the things I put for like the audience that actually cares about finance or whatever I put into Twitter. But it always cross posts, and I get some interesting conversations with friends on the Blue App. Again, there, admittedly, I might be behind. I have a lot of friends who still work at or are involved in Facebook, and so like, there's kind of a nice. They're probably in Facebook more than most humans of the same demographic. But it is interesting because I've kind of moved that stuff into Threads, and now those like friend conversations are really kind of over, and they're sad. It's like Dustin Moskowitz is the only one I feel like is consistently on Threads, right? Like, yeah, Threads is just my Dustin app. Like that's yeah. like, I go to threads yeah. to catch up on Dustin and that's pretty much it. The number, the intersection of humans I interact with online has actually shifted in the last six months in a weird way hmm. because Instagram is still Instagram and like Twitter is actually still Twitter. LinkedIn is now a thing that it wasn't before six months ago. And I think that's, I think I it was that's a not thing. just me. 
No, no, I think it's like really accelerated in the last six months. I sense. agree I with you. you I agree with you. For everyone or just for you? No, I no, think for I mean I, I think for everyone. And threads is kind of a thing, although I don't personally get much engagement on it. And then for me, the, the Facebook core app thing has been interesting. I'm not sure how that will play. I mean, I've been using that app for 20 years, right? And like, it's just interesting to see the patterns change. What, do you, what would you guys do? How would you direct the future of the Blue app amid this sea change? I feel like the Blue app is just the, the foundation of the Swiss Army knife that is meta. And so it's like where all my core profile information and like what? real really? friends are. Yeah. I've deleted and then the Blue app like last year sometime i always miss my messages okay, but i want to hear brit so you like you like store some stuff there so everything i post on instagram flows through mostly because i know my parents and all their friends are yeah, on it i and do they the same see thing it. yeah i don't often check those comments i don't check the messages i know it has all of my like photos from back in the day and it like is a container for my real friend graph that I don't have on Instagram. But that's or not thread. accurate. It's not real. There's nothing real about it. You never interact well, with it. Okay. It's the one social network has the, the most real friends out of any of the social networks, to put it that way. Like my college friends that's true. are there. This is my favorite thing to debate. What are real friends okay. in social oh, media? Yeah. But then Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, LinkedIn are kind of like more active places for me to be posting on a day-to-day -day basis based on the use case. Sam has a professional tone in all of his content to some regard. That, that That's a strong statement. There are no capitalizations <laughs> in any of his content. So some he might say use, it wasn't quite yeah, professional. He doesn't use punctuation correctly. Depends on how you define professional. <laughs> no, that's just to prove I'm human. <laughs> I read an article that said you'll live longer if you don't use capitalization. I promise you this was an actual you waste article. less time in your life. I mean, Sam was talking about his emotions earlier, and I was wondering whether that was actually a real statement. <laughs> He's on spring break. He's chilled out a little bit. He has facial hair this week. So, so I'm a different persona on all the different networks. Like with LinkedIn, I'm a little bit more professional. On Instagram, I'm a little bit more visual day in the life. On Pinterest, it's aspirational. But that has, but that I'm a, like a weird. But Brent, I think that makes you choose. Like, so my strategy on this stuff is very simple, which is just utter deep authenticity and fuck the network because you'll find the right people if you like play to what it wants. It's not shocking. But that is right? authenticity. Like, yeah. These are all authentic parts of me. This I, is authentic part as the audience. Thank you, Jess. That it, like the people that follow me on Pinterest want a specific version of me that's authentic to me. But it's not like me spouting off VC trends. Like <laughs> they want to see my like Minecraft birthday party I'm designing for my. Yeah, son it's like weekend. I find. Okay, so my version of this is like we've been doing this podcast and we've got videos to post. And I find when Brit, when you post videos in Instagram, it's like a jarring experience because like, that's not what people are used to seeing from you there. And right. I, I yeah. experience it like, this is a strange context to see this in. And I think this is like actually kind of what we're talking about. Like what- I'll give you that. I do treat Instagram differently than the other stuff. Yeah. Which is Instagram for me is just surfing and skiing vacation porn. Everyone, and I see anyone who follows me on Instagram, they're like, you're on vacation again. And I'm like, <laughs> You're like, you're not wrong. <laughs> I'm All right. Working. Let's keep moving because there's more information <laughs> happening. Well, yeah. And just, I do think there is this like power. I mean, it goes back last summer we, with threads. We were talking about what's next for social. And I think, Dave, you were like predicting a, a renaissance of sorts. And I, don't, I think this conversation kind of validates that. Yeah, my, my answer to you on this, Jess, is I might just have to build something new. I know, but you say that. You well, either tempt get, me with an app tuned. or an op-ed. It's getting An app closer. or an op-ed. Op-ed, are you here? I have some new ideas to things to build. I'm not going to talk about them. I'm excited. About. Yeah, that's my app. problem, Jess, is that like I could throw out <laughs> strategy for the blue app, but you know, I'd rather just build something. Well, okay, last question is you guys, have you been playing with this Naval smiley face app with the voice? Yeah, I just got it. Yeah. No, tell me. I mean, I'm uneducated. It was like I had a day last week where my entire notification thread was like thousands of people joining this app. I'm just so annoyed that everyone is using the same viral user experience flow on all these social apps right now that like mass text your friends in order for you to get access. Like that one I sent you about how hot are you, Sam? <laughs> Remember that app? I'm actually surprised that Apple's allowing this. Like it, it to me, it's it's like a re back to the future, right? Like okay. this is like Plaxo. I've never heard of this app, and I don't think our Dave, viewers. Have. Why don't you start from the beginning? What do you mean? Well, it's invite only, Jess. 
<laughs> Dave, explain first of all the Naval's app, but also explain the user flow that is really spammy that Apple should be banning. Well, okay, so the app's called AirChat, and it is Clubhouse. I'm already laughing. It's it's a it's a Clubhouse like it's an audio based social experience, and I actually like the way that it's async Clubhouse. Sort of. It's kind of live sometimes, isn't it? I mean, it's threaded, a Twitter, but you speak into your phone. Guys, the last 60 seconds could have been an episode of Silicon Valley. I'm just saying that. Keep moving. An async clubhouse, Naval, smiley, noted. What do you do, Dave? You open it up and you open a thread on it and you can hear people talking about topics of interest-based topics. Can you talk back? Yeah. Yeah. And that's the only interaction. And I like the way that Naval described it, actually, that he just wants to have a house party that he can open up in his pocket at any point in time and just have conversations with interesting people. Okay. So that's cool. my life stage is that I don't want that. Sure. But I do. The thing, the thing that I think is interesting with the app is I've said for a long time, and I, I do strongly believe that if you think about it, in an ideal world, the way to interact with people is you speak and read right? Like that's the way to interact. It's it's better for me to speak and I don't, and listening is too slow. Reading is much faster, right? So the best thing is speak and read. They've really nailed this. This is a speak and read Mm. mobile app. They've really nailed that. Yeah. Now the problem, yeah. So I think that that I By the way, give uh, Brian Norgard props too, because he's the co-founder and he was the chief of product at Tinder and he's one of the great product guy. And so they've got a good team there that's working on this. Have they raised money? Who did they raise from? I think it's self-funded. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's like that. I like as an experience. I think, that, and I think it's like the correct insight. I just like don't need more tech people yelling at me in the world right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as we yell, I want to do the yelling. I don't want to be yelled at. <laughs> Sam, we could go on our. We could do a read out the YouTube comments of hate. Uh, you know, from the podcast. Oh, do we get some hate? I would love to hear about this because I love strong <laughs> reactions. We only got one hate. We got one hater comment. One hater comment. I just read it, guys. It's also it, it's feedback on the our editing too. They did yeah. not like our cold open I think selection. I for-, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Wait, what was the comment? I haven't read it. Here, uh, the dramatic reading is: that's your cold open for an hour long podcast. Then five minutes intro of nothing but empty banter. What are you even talking about? Only to finally arrive at a topic discussing unsubstantiated accusations by a propaganda publication. All hey, I've, I've heard all I've ever need to just simply downvote and do not recommend this channel. And also, yeah, the funny thing is, all, all press is good. It sounds like the person actually listened to the whole thing. Which oh, wait, is shocking. Sam, it gets better. I rarely feel so robbed of my time to leave a comment like this, but this show is a great example of peak content saturation and useless fluff. Dave, Amazing. the fact that you read that in such a good dramatic voice, which is rare for you, let's be honest. <laughs> N- I'm a little nervous that more haters are going to leave comments just so that you can read in your dramatic <laughs> I'll voice do the it. comments. I'll do it. <laughs> Guys, if you give me the most downvoted show in tech. That would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, can I tell you a real story? Can I tell you a real story? Okay. Life360 is the board I'm on. Um, if you know the app, it, it's for families. You can follow, you know, you connect with your kids. Most A lot of parents of teenagers use this to make sure they know where they're at at all times. Teenagers hate this because parents feel, they feel like they're being Imagine that. Their parents. Teenagers hate an app that their kids... They- you're, like, basically, you're on the board, you're like a narc. It's like you're on the board of the narc company. Okay, but listen, <laughs> a few years ago, all the teenagers on TikTok band together. They're like, fuck this app. Let's leave bad reviews, one star reviews. Up until then, Life 360 is like five star reviews all the way. So they leave one star reviews and they like for like weeks at a time. And like Life 360's ratings crashed and it was like they were review bombed by these teenagers. And all these mm. teenagers are on TikTok talking about Life 360. Da, 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 da. And then they're creating so much buzz for Life360. The Life360 TikTok profile starts growing because everyone's following them. The CEO, Chris, who's amazing, he's in our back channel, starts like being like, well, I guess if you can't beat him, join him. Starts like bringing him on, them onto the channel to talk about what they think about Life360, develop like a teen advisory board. Long story short, now they're back up to like a five-star review app. The teens actually are into it because Life360 listened to them, but they like gained all this press through the one-star review bombs. And I think that if we follow this with our podcast, (laughs) we could be a smash. (laughs) 
I know for a fact when when I like got all I like hate I hate Calendly and I I, got, I made this viral post with like the millions of people engaged with about how Calendly sucks and like I got thank yous from multiple board members of the company because they said that it drove their greatest month of growth <laughs> history was the debate about Calendly. There's no such thing as press in 2024. This just comes back to the face and heel theory of you know public engagement that we talked about on I don't know episode ten or whatever it was. <laughs> So good. You can yeah. be, it, it doesn't matter. You can choose cheers as your KPI or booze, and they both it work. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I think it, it's, it's kind of like that's great. Um, my favorite was the, the, the uh, Snowbird marketing campaign where Snowbird, the mountain is a great ski mountain, had this basically what they did is that for a marketing campaign, they took all the one star reviews, which were like one star, too steep, or like <laughs> one star. Too much powder. And like these were all real <laughs> reviews. And they like they just made big posters of them. And that was their marketing. Oh, that's good. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> I'll also say just not to give like this it. guy more. We're gonna air make time. a poster. Peak content saturation, more Peak or less. Fluff. Fluff. <laughs> I also think, I mean, I share like I, I I also would have chosen a different cult open. So like kudos for the useful feedback, and I appreciate that. But I've never listened to it. <laughs> to call the New York Times unsubstantiated rumors when like he obviously didn't read the article shocker because you know there's all sorts of confirmations in there too so i actually think i I'll, this is good just so one of us needs to be actually upset for this to have any credibility so I, I could care less honestly my skin has grown so thick but i i want to just use th- this this gentleman who i could care less about's point to just also say like he's one of this tribe of people who thinks like journalism is invalid. I mean, he clearly like to call something published by the New York Times unsubstantiated rumors when in the article there's like clear confirmation, clear sourcing. Like we we should be wary of this, folks. So this guy mm. probably also is really unfit and really unsuccessful and lives in a basement. No, of his it's like <laughs> make fun of us all day long and make fun. I mean, again, we're, we're we're not trying to do high art here, but I also think I'm trying to do. High yeah, art. speak for yourself, <laughs> Jess. Clearly, I'm so tired from surfing. I can't even think. Guys, you're bantering like, too much. We need to move on. We have to move on. Otherwise, the more one-star reviews. Yeah, we can't <laughs> afford more reviews like this. <laughs> or can we? Okay, let's talk about uh, um, someone who's not at all controversial and will get us absolutely no opinionated comments, Elon Musk. Uh-oh. Oh, boy. So, never heard of him. <laughs> never heard of him. Guys, I don't think things are going well at Tesla. There have been a lot of stories. First, it Is all- that substantiated? <laughs> well, he, here, here are the facts. The cold. The information had a good article today. I, I read it. Thank you, Dave. I also read it. Team's doing a great job without me. I learned some stuff about. I didn't realize like Joe Gebbia is on the board at Tesla. Our org charts. I actually they're the very board, good. The board member part of our org chart is often some of the most valuable. It's and very good. Surprising. I had no idea. Thanks, Dave. But I don't know. So to recap, what's happening? couple week or so ago there was a rumor that he was canceling what the model two or Reuters yeah. did model what, two in favor of the self-driving i think and then of course he he posted on x that that wasn't true but now but Reuters says it's true and they have Is the model two a motorcycle no it's a, it's like a small you know a small hatchback like a volkswagen golf or you know something like that yeah also a fact laid off 10 percent of the company that's good maybe it is maybe it's not didn't they pause all cyber truck distributions yes and so basically investors let's see how the stock's doing here down down 400 billion yeah so basically here's my question for you guys will elon be running tesla in 12 months yes Unless he does some hissy fit about his compensation package and like... What I don't totally understand is why there's no Gwen over there, you know? Like, it it seems like it... And by Gwen, you mean a very competent number two. Yeah, you know, somebody like a real operator running the place, right? That this is an important company. You know, you can have your opinions about Elon and etc. But like Tesla is a really important company that makes really pretty extraordinary products that a lot of people drive. And well, I think that like, 
Let Dave finish. I, I just think that it's kind of frankly akin to the 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 Twitter Square thing, right? Like both companies were really important. They both deserved to have a full-time operator running the thing. And when I looked at the org chart this morning, it's interesting to look at, I guess there's something like 35 reports into the CEO, which is Sounds like Google. typical of how I, I guess Elon likes running companies. We could get into debate around like his management philosophy, which I do think there's some merit to. But it, he's got a lot going on, and this is an important company. Like It just seems like the right mature high integrity move to put a good operator in place running the place well, that, didn't you just didn't you just explain why it won't happen i don't know the, um, I? Look, I think i think the reality is that this, you asked the question before like will you be running in 12 months and then why isn't there the same, same answer right which is that tesla is actually the thing that elon's like brand and ego is by far most tied up in i don't know right? like spacex is pretty up there no, look, I love SpaceX. I'm very conflicted because I actually am a SpaceX shareholder and have been forever. Because how can you not? It's so fucking cool. I love SpaceX. SpaceX is the company in the Elon world that makes me like really annoyed because I like it so much and it's clearly Elon's, right? But like, so, you know, I hate everything else, but that one is just like really emotionally tough for me because I do love it. But yeah, I think the Tesla thing, like his whole narrative, I'm the founder, even though he's not the founder, but I'm the real founder. And I'm going to like manhandle this to success. And it's most of his wealth. Like, I think his ego is like incredibly tied up in its success. Right. And so I think for him to put in a number two or like do anything other than like personally march across the finish line as much as possible is just too emotionally difficult for him to think about. Hmm. Right. It's just against like his philosophy. Hmm. Look, the reality is again, like my whole stress with Elon is usually like, if he was always wrong and always bad, it'd be easy because he'd just be bad. But he's not. Like, there's stuff he's actually right about. There's stuff he does that's great, like SpaceX. And even Tesla, like, look, his whole thing of, like, I'm going to sleep on the floor because they have to see me sleeping on the floor on the way in and out of the building. Like, that's right, right? Like, and, like, that's cool. And, like, yeah. credit to him yeah. for doing it. But I think those types of things means that, like, he could never hand over significant power in it. Right, especially from a place of weakness. Like the only way he could do that is if it was so stratospherically successful in his mind. He's like, I won. Now I'm gonna go do like be more Elon and even more categories. Right. And I think you can't when it's declining or in under pressure, it's like one of those things where you dig in. It's the same thing, by the way, with uh, the Harvard Corporation, if you want to jump there, right? Which is like they're just egotistically unable to like pivot out of a failure, right? Because it's just from an ego perspective. Let's skip the hard one. We'll talk about that some other time. Mm. Mm. Okay, so Sam thinks, yes, Elon running Tesla in 12 months. Britt and Dave? I think, yes. I was just looking, and not that it's like a great sign, but the stock has been, is actually kind of flat to where it was a year ago today. It had some really big bumps in the last year. I think their peak was at 293. They're at 150 right now. The more important metric is deliveries. I mean, yeah. I think, Brett, the That's more the important metric is about. deliveries, right? Like Tesla deliveries this last quarter were down, not just quarter over quarter, but they right. were down against one year ago, which is, you know, this is happening across the board and especially in EVs. But, you know, that it's the first time it's ever happened to the company. Well, and let's be clear, but the price is back to pre-2021. Yeah. Well, right? that's, like, uh, yeah. It's not like... I just can't. I love 2021 in general, though. Like, if you think about it, like, there's a story of this is marching up into the right, but this has actually been trading horizontally since, like, mid-2020. For a right? while. Is what I mean. And, like, look, I think the reality is, like, I, again, we all know this. It's, like, you know, the, elect the EV thing is great in some ways intellectually, but it's not playing out the way anyone expected it to. People like gasoline. Gasoline's sweet. Well, it's right? also and like, just, it, it hasn't gotten, the price just hasn't gotten to the, ba basically your price per electric mile, right? Like it's still, you still have a 300 mile range and your price is still high for that range. If you had a $30,000, 600 mile range car, it would be game over. Like everyone would drive them. Sure, but no, but Tesla's not going to have that on their own. It's a market like any other company, and like I think the reality is, is like even like, that's sure, I was referring to the entire market, not just Tesla. No, no, but I'm just saying like so. You think about it, like there's two basic car car futurist bets, right? There's self driving and there's like EV live forever things. Like the EV drive forever thing, like 
you know, Tesla started there or like started with EVs being sweet, but they don't have that much of an advantage in EVs. They're not the biggest shipping EV company in the world anymore. It's that Chinese company. Everyone has EVs. That kind of like structural advantage that makes them dramatically more valuable or differentiated from car companies is gone. doesn't mean you won't like their car, Dave, but it's just like, it's just a car. So then you have to double down on what else can they do that's actually unique that makes them worth way more than other car companies. That giga batteries. What's it called? Which has to be self-driving. It's self-driving. I mean, the battery, they can be marginally better. They're not going to be four times better. Does it batteries. have to be? I mean, it's clear that this company is extraordinary at manufacturing, at least for an American company. No, Dave, that's actually the story I've been told by many people. This is, now, this is unsubstantiated but from smart people, is Tesla actually sucks at manufacturing, mm. right? Like the story they tell people is that they're good at it, but actually compared to like real manufacturing companies and real car companies, the whole irony is that they're really bad at it. They're really inefficient. They don't have the same precision. Like they can't tool up the same way. They've gotten away with a ton because the margins have been potentially quite good and they've been so well funded and the stock market's given them so much credit. But like this whole thing where like they couldn't get the production line started, so they did it in the parking lot. Like they've actually been an operational, like industrial grade mess when it comes to from when it comes to manufacturing. That's the story I've been told, at least. Again, I, I this is not a specialty of mine, but I, I don't think the assumption of like they're good at manufacturing is actually like a, a thing I would just take at face value. Well, I mean, I guess just in terms of American new like startups that have scaled up to become great manufacturing powerhouses, right? Like, I mean, it's like, who else in America? I mean, okay, so first quarter 2024, they delivered 386,000 units, right? Like, that's a lot of stuff. No, it's not. That's the thing to keep in mind is like for a car company, that's like pittance, right? And that's part of the whole thing with Tesla is that it's not that big. Right, like we're in the Bay Area, so we see a lot of them. But on an Amer- from a manufacturing, like like actual car company scale perspective, they're small and they kind of suck at it. And like they've always been given great credit by the financial markets for the vision of can they control, you know, the electric car pipeline and like the refueling and da da da, da and the, the the battery stations or the technology angle or the design and marketing. But they're kind of coming back to earth and like it's a car company. Right. And like, I think the whole thing with FSD and like people being so excited about it is it is kind of the Hail Mary, right? Of like, okay, what can they do that like no one else can deliver right now that makes them not a traditional car company? Right. And I don't know. Like, I think the people argue about whether it's good or not a lot. I'm looking at the numbers and it's like, you know, it looks, I don't know, I'm trying to find it newer. Q1 2020, GM was doing about a million per quarter. So, you know, they're. No. They're 30% of a GM. Yeah, at like 10 times the valuation. I mean, Sam, like, you nailed it with the lower costs. I mean, there's two fascinating things going on in this market. Like one is the threat of the lower cost products from China and what Trump sure. and Biden are, are saying and their different approaches for potentially dealing with that huge issue. And then the other is just like miscalculating demand and the market not being anywhere where people thought it would be. Well, and I I and do also think just it. making choices about what to do next, right? Like when I saw the announcement that this Model 2 wasn't going to ship, that actually was the first time where I had to take off my, you know, I love Tesla products as a customer, right? Like we've had almost every generation of Tesla, we love the love the products. But putting that taking that hat off and putting my business hat on, Hearing that the Model 2 wasn't going to ship was, a to me, scary, right? Because that's that's your super high volume, you know, really accessible car that, you know, maybe could have revitalized this growth curve before we get to this self-driving world, which to me still feels five, 10 years away, right? And so this thing's just going to stay sideways if they don't get that car out the door. Yeah. And, and Sam, as you said, it's a very classic, like, no one, you know, car companies aren't worth that much to so make it a tech car company. I mean, I don't know why investors continue to fall for this. Well, it's because they love, it's the same, tech, they don't know, tech investors aren't dumb, right? Well, some of them are, but like, they're not all dumb. I think like, I think retail investors are the ones that propel the Tesla stock, not really tech investors, right? And retail investors love a good Hail Mary, right? It's basically a meme stock, right? On steroids, right? With, with more than zero behind it, to be clear. But like GM's like what? Like a $50 billion company, Tesla's a $500 billion company. Company GM delivers like six times as many cars, 
right? Like it's just, you know, it's not, if it's fin- from a financial value perspective, you have to believe some vision of the future. Tesla magically gets the jujitsu move of controlling all EV charging in America. Like mm-hmm. that'd be cool, right? Like then they're an oil company, right? Then they're an energy company. They're not a car company. Like that's an interesting narrative, but it's a narrative, right? Or like they're the only ones that can deliver self-driving. Great, that's pretty sweet. Like that puts them in an interesting position. But if they're just a car company, like it's got a long way to fall from where it is now. And that's that's the debate in the markets is what is it? But have we reached our, our opinion on this or do we think it's I think it's a car company. I think it's always been a car company with a GameStop slapped on top. <laughs> right. Mm. And like GameStop. <laughs> you don't give them any credit for software. Self driving? I just don't think that's what people buy cars for. Like, I don't know. Like, I buy the cars for the software. Like, my opinion has always been that this thing is a computer that drives, same. not a car that has a computer it just in it. Turns out, I don't want a computer but that drives. But you don't have a Tesla. Yet. No, this we is don't. the Moors and the Lexus. No, we do have a GM. Though. Well, we have a lot of, do we have you self drive your kids to school every day? Because I do. I have that petrifies me. Brett. They ask me to, me. and I'm not a luddite. <laughs> I'm not a luddite. I mean, that's the question. At what point will we really just want? software like software is not eating everything <gasps> Ooh, sorry Mark that's, a big, that's a big statement jess it it isn't it software is incredible and it's changing the way how we live on everything but it doesn't it's not eating journalism uh, uh wasn't our entire yeah, last that was, episode I mean, I about really eating journalism <laughs> No, no. It, it depends what you define as journalism, but it's, it's going to eat like it's going to eat human attention. But here's the thing: yeah, it, that's actually not the right question. Software can still eat everything, but if it's commodity, then it doesn't matter, right? Like then everyone just gets it and it's fine. It's like Apple. Like I can connect my phone and it plays music on any fucking car, right? If there's, it doesn't matter, right? Like it, it, it's like the self driving thing. I agree would be pretty. It, I if self driving is to the point you don't need a driver. That actually changes the world. I don't know, guys. Right? Like that's sort of like saying, well, you know, the iPhone has soft like, iPhone's hardware and software combination is commodity. So like therefore Android should like be as good as it or something like that. And it's just not true, right? Like but, but, Dave, this is a thing. Apple's an interesting one, right? Because I do agree that that's a great question. It's like it can Tesla be Apple. Is there to me the interesting I would argue is, like, that it is right now, but it's misexecuting. It's it's not. And here's the reason why. It's not a network. Like, iPhones are not actually that much better than Android phones. They're a little better. Like, they're a little better. Like, they, I, I use them. I'm not saying, but the reality is, why do I really use an iPhone? I use it because of iMessage, right? And I use it because of like the photo stuff is better, largely because it's networked together better, right? But there's like, there's return on scale of uh, having an, an iPhone. And not use it. You use it because your it computer, garden. but like there's like a network effect of all the yeah. devices, right? And like I would disagree. Like the Tesla is a network, right? Like in our house where we have multiple Teslas, you can switch between cars, it knows who you are, it switches, it puts your music on. Like it's it's a very similar integrated, fully vertically integrated hardware user experience that's very high quality. And you've also got a network of cars, like you can't. I guess you can't discount the, the the network of Teslas informing their self-driving system, which makes it better. I've experienced it over the years. You you also can't discount the electric charging network. Like it simply makes it better. But the electric better. charging network has already gone open and it will go open, right? They've already like made the deals with that and da 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 da. I agree, by the way, that the power company aspect of it is a story that if it were true and there's a real network to it, is an interesting angle to play. I just don't think it's happening that way. And then look, yeah, like so sure, remembers where my seat position is. Like that's not like a major inconvenience in my life. Like if it yeah. if it was like if my music came with me only in a certain type of car, fine, but it comes with me everywhere. It's on my phone. Like it doesn't matter, right? And so it is interesting. Like I, I do think that if Tesla could figure out ways to get the Apple like return on scale and like network lock in, I agree, then it's worth more than GM. But I just that's not the direction we see playing out right now. We see is it's a car company. Right, that bends metal, and sure, their software's a little better, so maybe they get a little premium pricing, but they're also shittier at manufacturing, so their margins are worse. Like, manufacturing right? is way more complex. I mean, it's complex for a phone, it's way more complex for a car. So, Dave, uh, it's pretty complex for phones. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I said. But I also, I guess the question is then, Dave, like, why 
I think you really, are, you articulated well the Tesla bull case, but that's been the Tesla bull case for a very, like, since the start of the company. And so is it just that, like, they need more time? But meanwhile, everyone's kind of catching up. And I don't think the software, again, it's hard to know if you don't use it, but it just doesn't seem like the incremental value of the network software experience is like worth as much as, you know, like having Google Maps on my phone, right? Or all these incredible things that mobile unlocked with software. And like the surveillance thing is real, but there's a lot of other ways to get the driving data. I mean, this has been a debate now for many, many years. And it's also very prospective. I think what we're in is like interesting saddle point where like Tesla's thing was EVs. The EV thing has been traded away. They're not the biggest EV manufacturer and everyone has EVs. And it turns out that EVs aren't even that good, at least not not delivering the way people expected them to in terms of like growth in the market. Okay. Right? So the EV okay. thing, negative. Then it has to be self-driving and like, we'll see. Let's give the Morins the final Tesla word before we go to the PCC. I think the final Tesla word is that we are the mores and you're the lesses on this one. <laughs> we are <laughs> we are long Tesla and we're the only ones. We are users. So we know a little bit more from a day-to-day basis. But it basis. sounded like there were cracks in your confidence in the business model. Well, I must Yeah, I mean, just- I, I think I articulated the, the crack really well. I, I, to your last question, Jess, I think that just like any product-driven technology company that sells to customers, you have to keep innovating, right? And it's the same question that we all ask of Apple and everyone, right? Like, is the Vision Pro the right next step? Is the, you know, and I, I think we're asking this exact same question of Tesla. Like, is the right next step to go after the self-driving van vi- or whatever vision only? Or do we need a Model 2 out there that's proves their manufacturing prowess is better than Sam articulates it maybe? And can they scale up to a million production? Like, can can the Model 2 close the production gap between 300,000 and a million units per month, right? Like, that's like a very simple way to think about it. Can the data network amongst all of the Tesla vehicles create a better self-driving neural network and deliver on that better than any other, you know, any other car platform? Like, maybe. We'll see, right? Like, I just, I, you got the last word, but, I just, but I'm going to just take the last word and say the problem, Dave, is that the first part doesn't justify the stock price. Yeah, sure. And so it's not even worth doing, right? If you're a $400 billion company, right? And you know that your comps are trading at a tenth of that on three or four times the volume, proving you're a good manufacturing company when you PS you're not doesn't actually, it hurts you, right? Because then you're just a car company. You have to get the self driving thing. That's the only play which is why they're so obsessed with it right now. It's the only thing that can possibly justify how they trade. I guess what I'm arguing though is you need both. You actually need more cars out there with more people and you need the self-driving thing to become a reality. Mm -hmm. That's certainly what the market is telling. Yeah. 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 Well, it's going to be fun. Okay, Britt, what's cooking in the pop culture This is a really big day today. I'm not sure if you're aware. (laughs) I'm I'm assuming you're not aware. And by the time that listeners are listening to this tomorrow... Question is, is they Sam will be aware. aware? Sam, do you have a guess? I'm Sam? not aware. Do you want to guess? Yes. It's got to be something with yes. Taylor Swift. Yeah. I think our sons know. Our sons are. This aware. is the only thing they could be a this big, is a big day. day. In pop. This is a big day. <laughs> the Tortured Poets Department, the album is dropping tonight, midnight Eastern. And when you start, when you're listening to this podcast, it will be out. And in true Taylor fashion, like, the marketing for this has been super clever. I think like the people listening can really just pick up on that. Like she put QR codes painted on walls. Like who's the, who's the guy, who's the artist that would leave like weird murals on walls. Bank, yeah, Banksy, Banksy, but they're QR codes and they were just like on walls and random. Isn't the single already out as yeah, we speak? Yeah, I think there's a, I think it just actually launched a couple hours ago. Yeah, the first single with Post Malone. Anyway, it's a big out. deal. For everyone, that's a Swifty. I think the thing about why it's a big deal in music is Taylor already has like all broken the number one singles record. <laughs> so this is going to put her way over the top and it'll be that much harder for whoever's going to come after her to compete. So see, Taylor has network totally. effects. Would you invest <laughs> in that stock? Uh, no, because by trading too high, <laughs> it's a meme stock. So you can't invest Because even if it's good, it's going to be priced by the Swifties to a stupid number. <laughs> right. I mean, at least we know they'll maintain it better than Truth Social. <laughs> Fair enough. This is exciting. And I lo- we have a separate Taylor chat that thread, Sam is so not we part can of. Share our- we Sam really should have shorted Truth Social after that episode. Uh, Everyone did. 
it was shorted so much that there was a danger of it going through the roof because they were out of shares. <laughs> Oh. That's pretty funny. Yeah. Okay, Brett, you got anything else for us? That's, What's that's I mean, a big that's one. A lot. No, the other one. I found a cool website this week that I think you'd enjoy. It's called BigShinyBalls.com. It's not a porn site. Um, it's actually a site where you can literally buy. <laughs> but whatever you do, do not misspell it. <laughs> you can literally buy giant inflatable balls. And speaking of the Minecraft birthday party I've been planning on Pinterest, there may or may not be some of these at our son's birthday party. You know what, Brett? I've been advertising this. I've been advertising the big shiny balls on Instagram, maybe because you were clicking on it, but I've seen these big shiny balls. What do you do with them? Kick them around and play with them. Man, that's saying something that Britt was looking at this and it showed up in Sam's Instagram. What does that mean about us, Sam? (laughs) I mean, it's not possible they came up with a demographic that targeted both of them. Not possible. No, it's probably because I kept typing in big shiny balls (laughs) into Google. (laughs) And it can't, and Instagram can't can't fulfill that demand. All right, so Jeff, they had to- you and I, we can discuss this offline. Yeah, I think what from here, do we go to the an offline version of the podcast. Yeah. So it is a good time to thank everyone for tuning in. We appreciate you. We appreciate the feedback, all of the feedback, most of the feedback. It's going to be a, a fun couple weeks. So thank you guys for listening. Share your comments and uh, we'll see you next And please, week. actually, try to experiment. <laughs> Downvote this. No. Everyone downvote this. Let's no, see what don't do it. <laughs> like, I want a maximum downvote. Not on it. Just, just on, on YouTube. YouTube. Let's just see what happens. Okay, let's have a team meeting on strategy before <laughs> we go wrong. Let me get the marketing campaign. Most downvoted podcast in technology. It's great. Be your authentic self in the comments and we appreciate it. Okay, bye Bye-bye. guys. <laughs> see you guys later. If you enjoyed this show, please leave us a virtual high five by rating it and reviewing it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcast. Find more information about each episode in the show notes and follow us on social media by searching for at more or less, at Dave Morin, at Lesson, at J Lesson, and as for me, I'm at Brit. See you guys next time.